Hi, my name is Dr. Ross Hauser. Welcome to the Hauser Next Center here in Fort Myers, Florida. Really important topic I'm going to cover today. And it's going to be one of the longer videos, but there's so many people that have migraine headaches. I wanted to explain the association between visual symptoms and migraine. Typically, we call that migraine with aura. But there's also a condition called visual snow that, that's so common in migraines, and I wanted to explain why that is. Where we're heading is basically here, uh, how ligamentous cervical instability causes migraines with and without auras and visual snow. As you can see in the illustration here that when you have a forward head face down lifestyle or you get into a car accident or have some trauma in your neck, basically the neck curve instead of being lordotic and with the trauma or the face down a lifestyle, basically the neck curve gets like this. You know, instead of being this way, it ends up this way, and that crowds the front of the neck. The ligamentous cervical instability causes a stretch and compression of the vagus nerve. That can cause vagus nerve degeneration. The combination of that can lead to migraines. Now, when the neck curve changes, you can actually get irritation of the C1 and C2 nerve, and that also can cause migraines. And then when the neck curve changes, you get jugular vein compression, which ultimately that in and of itself can cause migraines to become chronic. And when you get intracranial hypertension, the brain arteries dilate and when the brain arteries dilate, that makes a migraine headache more prevalent because the pathophysiology of migraine is dilation of the arteries. And the medications such as triptans or sumatriptan, they basically cause vasoconstriction of the arteries. So anything that causes arterial dilation in the brain is going to make somebody more prone to migraines. And part of the pathophysiology of all this is trigeminal nerve stimulation or dysfunction. And we'll talk about that. And when you get intracranial hypertension and internal jugular vein compression, you can get fluid around the optic nerve, which can cause all kinds of visual distortions, such as visual snow. So what is a migraine headache? A migraine is a headache that can cause severe throbbing, pain, or a pulsing sensation. Usually people will describe it as boom, 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 like an ice pick behind the eye. And it's usually on one side of the head, but plenty of people have it bilaterally. Though when, there's, when it is on one side, that's typically the side where we see more instability. Uh, everybody knows it's associated with nausea, vomiting, extreme sensitivity to light and sound. And because a person feels so much better when they lay down, this is an indication that it probably does have something to do with the posture of the neck. Because there's a lot more force on the neck when you're upright. So any condition that is better when you lay down, that's an indication that it's likely that a person has ligamentous cervical instability as the structural cause of their problem. There's lots of different uh, criterion for migraine with and without aura. Migraine without aura, the diagnostic criterion is at least five attacks. The headache lasts from four to 72 hours. It has to have two of the following characteristics, unilateral in location, pulsatile, moderate to severe intensity, and it's aggravated by physical activity. Any sort of a brain condition, personality changes, mental fog, headache, head pressure, that's made worse with physical activity, again, is a sign that it probably has something to do with the neck because when you're moving and you're doing stuff, that puts a lot more strain on the neck. Obviously, they're during a headache, at least one of the following, nausea, vomiting, photophobia, or phonophobia. So 
Light and sound sensitivity, as you guys know, is a common symptom that we see with cervical instability. And again, another way somebody might know that the migraine headache is related to the neck is because either right before the headache or the person suffers with muscle tension in the neck. So if somebody says, man, my neck is all tense and they have a history of migraines, it's probably from the neck. The muscles are tense because the muscles are trying to stabilize the neck because of ligamentous instability. I had a patient, actually a new patient from yesterday who got tested today. They had just unbelievable vertigo. I mean, to the point where it would take them like a week to recover and it was terrifying to the person. And they said, I'm just telling you, doc, I got a tension here. Then like over the course of a day, once I get that tension, then the neck gets tense. Then man, the next day I get this terrible vertigo. So that's a sign that it's likely that the neck, some kind of problem with the neck and it's usually upper cervical instability is what's causing the problem. Any condition where it's, set, where it's more prevalent in females than males, I think the likely cause then is gonna be some type of ligamentous cervical instability. So think of that, like what's the difference between males and females? Well, we know one thing that's different is the hormones. So any sort of medical condition, fibromyalgia, some of the autoimmune diseases like lupus, um, Various different kinds of injuries like the ACL uh, injuries are way more common in females. And migraine headache, think about that. Migraine prevalence is two to three times more common in females than males, but goes up to three to four times more prevalent in women after puberty. Men have typically more musculature and women, they're just loose jointed. And that loose jointedness in the neck, in my opinion, is what makes migraine headaches more prevalent in females than males. Migraines, it affects 10 to 20% of the population. In general, it's 20% of females and 10% of males. Globally, it's 18% of the general population. So think of this, one in five people around the world have migraine headaches. And honestly, the prevalence just keeps increasing. And I think it's because 90, 5% of the world population has a cell phone. Looking down five to eight hours a day at a cell phone, that is not good for the human neck. And any condition that's from ligamentous cervical instability, the prevalence is just gonna be going up and up and up. When it starts, it typically starts in teenage years or the early 20s. Think of this. In the world, it ranks second in years lived with disability as defined by the Global Burden of Disease study. And that was a global study. So in other words, the second most disabling condition as it relates to years that you have to live with it. So the average person, if they get migraine headaches starting when they're 10 and they live to be 85, it's 75 years they had to live with migraine headaches. And anybody who's had migraine headaches would know that it typically is a progressive disorder. And that's another clue that it's related to the neck. So anybody with migraine headaches who has a lot of neck tension, they have clicking popping in the neck, they, it's getting worse. You know, so that means whatever condition is causing it, it's getting worse and worse and worse. Uh, and again, ligamentous cervical instability is similar to a loose screw on a hinge that when the door is loose and one of the screws on the hinge is loose, every time you open and close the door, the screw gets looser and the other screws get looser. So that's why if you have ligamentous injury, say right here in the neck, it's going to progress down the neck. And so any condition like migraine headaches or other headaches that's related to that, it's going to be progressive. I put this in here just as a reminder. I'm not saying that there's not other causes of migraine because clearly people who, females who have migraines typically will tell you that in the PMS, the premenstrual part of their menstrual cycle, right before menstruation or during menstruation, they'll have like awful, awful migraines. Typically that is from 
too little progesterone. So that's where holistic doctors might give a woman some progesterone and it, often that has a good effect of reducing migraine frequency. Obviously proper diet. Sometimes there's a food sensitivity. My wife is very sensitive to sulfites or MSG. MSG could give her a migraine, but she's very careful now. So she's really careful looking at ingredients on labels. A lot of people don't know that modified yeast extract, or if you ever see that on a label and you're sensitive to MSG, you might be sensitive to modified yeast extract. So there definitely are other causes of migraines. I'm talking about the structural cause of migraine and the structural cause of migraine typically is a breakdown of the cervical curve from ligamentous cervical instability. And obviously migraine treatment depends on what is the etiology. Sometimes the etiology is hormonal, food we talked about, poor posture. Obviously all of us should be having our computers up to help us with proper posture. And when cervical destructure or breakdown of the cervical curve or ligamentous cervical instability is the etiology of the migraines and of course prolotherapy and curve correction is indicated. External stressors, people are under a lot of stress and that can be a trigger for a migraine. So obviously if you're under a lot of stress, figure out ways that you can have joy. But obviously if somebody's worse and their female is worse at a certain time of the menstrual cycle, then obviously I would say correct that part of the equation too. If somebody says, I'm just telling you every time I meet my mother-in-law and I got stress, you know, my migraines are worse. Well, obviously what I would do as a physician is have them write down all the wonderful things about their mother-in-law and all the different things to pray about. Because often it isn't stress that causes problems, it's our reaction to stress. So the more we learn to love people, right? Because love does make the world go round. Love is the most important attribute to experience, to have, to give out. And I believe God wants us to be conduits of his love to everybody. So all of us should be working on how do I get to be a more loving, caring, kind individual. And if we all do that, the life's going to be so much better for all of us and more good's going to happen in the world versus complaining and uh, having uh, irritating people upset us, right? Because if you are very strong in love, you are somebody who looks at the best in people and when somebody's upset, you have mercy and grace uh, toward them instead of anger and bitterness, uh, then you're able to pray effectively for them. And I think why Jesus taught that you should do good to those who persecute you and pray for your enemies is when you pray for somebody, over time you grow to love them and that's ultimately the characteristic that God wants all of us to have is his enormous and great love. Again, I said migraines is the second leading cause of years lived with disability. Aura is recurrent attacks lasting minutes or unilaterally fully re reversible visual sensory or other CNS symptoms typically followed by a migraine. So an aura is just kind of what occurs right before the migraine. Visual aura is when there's transient presence of positive and negative visual symptoms before, during, or after a migraine attack. And we're going to talk about the pathophysiology of that. So there's migraines which Again, most migraines do have some kind of sensory thing that happens before the migraine. A lot of times it's actually neck tension and then the person's going to get a migraine. Some people can get, there's a tingling in the arm, the leg. A lot of times the aura is some kind of visual. There's flashing lights, visual snow, other things, and then they get a migraine attack. Visual aura symptoms occur in 98 to 99% of people who have an aura before a migraine. Visual snow can be a standalone syndrome or be associated with migraines, and we'll talk more about that. Around 40% of people after an inciting event, such as traumatic brain injury, concussion, suffer with visual snow. So again, 
whether it's migraines or visual snow, it's so common after neck trauma or head trauma. So that's another clue that it probably is related to injury of the neck. Now people are like, no, 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 concussion, that's from a brain injury. Well, think about a concussion. And uh, so uh, two kids or two people are playing soccer and they hit their head. When you hit, when you have a trauma to the skull here, when you hit the object, you turn your head. And when you turn your head, you hit your head. Then when you turn your head, it goes like this. So that you get an injury to the C1, C2 vertebrae. And it's that non-healed, unresolved upper cervical instability that in my opinion leads to the long-term sequelae of concussion and post whiplash syndrome, including vertigo, migraines, headache, dizziness. And I believe that if somebody corrects their curve and does prolotherapy to the injured ligaments, that not only will the symptoms stop, but I think you can stop the progression of somebody getting CTE or chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Basically, visual snow is associated with uh, migraines in 52 to 70% of patients and tinnitus 34 to 75% of the time. Migraine patients with aura and people with visual snow syndrome have similar findings on neuroimaging. They have hyperactivity in the visual cortex, which again is probably from the vasodilation of the arterial or blood flow to those regions. You're gonna see several uh, slides here that talk about the pathophysiology. I just wanted to give references, so if anybody want is, wants to dive deeper, this figure or study talks about external triggers evoke activation of the trigeminovascular afferents. So in other words, something triggers the trigeminal nerve to affect the vasculature in the brain. So that's a key component. So in other words, most migraine, headache, scientific articles and research note that there's something that causes the trigeminal nerve, the trigeminal nerve to dilate the arteries in the brain. This uh, slide talks about that there's calcitonin gene-related peptides. So V2 is the V2 branch of the trigeminal nerve, V1 and V3. So the trigeminal nerve, this is the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve. The maxillary branch goes here and then the mandibular branch. And when you stimulate the trigeminal nerve, there are certain substances in the brain that go up and CGRP is one of them. And they cause vasodilation of the arteries in the brain. And there's other mechanisms, including the sphenopalatine. And in our office, sometimes I inject platelet-rich plasma into the sphenopalatine ganglion to change or affect brain function. I put this in here too, just as a reminder, there's people who have migraine headaches and they have sinusitis or they're always like, this side of my face is always stuffy. That again, relates to the parasympathetic system and ultimately it relates to the cervical spine. And this explains even greater that CGRP, and there's lots of different substances that can actually cause neurogenic inflammation in the brain, which makes the neurons and the dura and a lot of things in the brain more and more sensitive to give pain and to make the arteries more sensitive to vasodilation. So vasodilation is actually what causes the headache. So the medications that are used, including caffeine and triptans, various triptans, there's <laughs> every week there seems to be a new triptan for migraines. They're very effective in most cases of migraine headache to reduce the headache. But the question always is, is 
if the stimulation of the trigeminal nerve causes the vasodilation through these mechanisms, what's causing the activation of the trigeminal nerve? And it's my opinion that it's ligamentous cervical instability in the neck, and I'll explain, I'll explain why. So again, neurogenic inflammation from the various substances like substance P and CGRP causes pain perception, sensitizes the brain to pain perception, and then it also causes vasodilation and acute inflammation. So that's why some medications, some people even with their migraines take a bunch of ibuprofen or steroids, it reduces this in neurogenic inflammation. But again, I would say a better option would be, why not figure out what's causing the neurogenic inflammation, what's causing the vasodilation, and ultimately that likely is injury to the neck. So here I just want to show a video. This is an ultrasound tech. See the pulsating? That's actually what it looks like in the brain. So these are that that's our ultrasound machine and that's the person getting evaluated. You could just see the 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 large arteries and it's going boom ba boom ba boom ba boom and this person was actually having a migraine headache. So that's actually a migraine headache in action. And the cause for this person and a lot of people that we see is actually ligamentous cervical instability, especially upper cervical instability. And the treatment for that is uh, prolotherapy. So I put this in here just to show that there is a connection between the vagus nerve and the trigeminal nerve. And again, what are the clues that migraine headache or any kind of headache is related to the neck. Obviously other signs or symptoms. So somebody came in and they said, I'm just telling you, I have migraine headaches, but I got a lot of other symptoms. I have tachycardia. I have tachycardia. I have constipation. My stomach doesn't work so good. I'm getting bloating all the time. Or I have a lot of gastroesophageal reflux. Uh, I have numbness in the extremities, I'm having trouble breathing. All these things can be related to the vagus nerve. Well, the ganglion of the vagus nerve sits right at C1, right in front of C1, and it's irritation of the C1 nerve or the C2 nerve that can cause an acute migraine. So in other words, in emergency rooms, when you have an acute migraine, some of the doctors will block the C1 nerve or the C2 nerve. So the C1 nerve runs right between the occiput and the atlas and the C2 nerve runs right between the atlas and the axis C1 and C2. And even in our office, I've blocked those nerves and there are times where you can completely eliminate an acute migraine attack. And you've heard me say on other videos, whenever you hear the trigeminal nerve, so let me talk about the trigeminal nerve. The trigeminal nerve innervates the muscles of mastication, which is chewing. So the masseter muscle and the other muscles, the pterygoid muscles, the other muscles that have to do with chewing, those are innervated by the trigeminal nerve. The trigeminal nerve innervates all the sensation on the face, and it also does the sensation on the tongue, everything in the mouth. It's been shown that trigeminal nerve stimulation is what causes in many people the dilation of the arteries in migraine. So that would mean that possibly even chewing, right? Even chewing stimulates the trigeminal nerve or stimulating the face uh, stimulates the trigeminal nerve. So that's the connection between why, why do I laugh? Like I have a patient who says when they laugh or they talk a lot, that can give them terrible migraines, right? Because those things stimulate the trigeminal nerve. So their, their trigeminal nerve is hypersensitive. Like there's some people that come in and they'll literally say a certain part of the face, if they touch a certain part of the face, they'll get some terrible symptom. They could get terrible ringing in the ears. They could get a headache. You know, like, like just stimulating, there's, there's, 
the trigeminal nerve is so hypersensitive. So the reason why the trigeminal nerve is so hypersensitive in some people is because there's an injury in the upper cervical region because the trigeminal nerve, the neurons of the trigeminal nerve go from the brain stem all the way down to C3. So C right here, so this is called the trigeminal cervical nucleus. It goes all the way down to C3. So that means somebody could have an injury in the upper neck region. And you would know you have that because there's, it's always tense there. You always want to get a massage or it's just always tender, right? So if I go like this, if a person went like this and they do the same amount of pressure right here and you're, and you're like, oh my gosh, it's, it hurts more here. Like I go here with the same amount of pressure and I go here and it hurts a lot more here. Well, there's probably a ligamentous injury right here. So ligamentous cervical injuries, they cause ex excessive movements of the bone. And the excessive movements of the bone can cause irritation of the C1 nerve, C2 nerve, C3 nerve. Once those nerves are irritated, they can stimulate the trigeminal nerve. So imagine if this occurs over and over and over again, and the stimulation of the trigeminal nerve causes vasodilation of the arteries in the brain, that's gonna give a person, they're gonna be more likely to get a migraine. So you could see where somebody does a hypoallergenic diet to reduce neurogenic inflammation, they eliminate uh, wheat, they eliminate dairy, they might get a food sensitivity test by a functional medicine doctor, a natural medicine doctor, and they eliminate other foods and they're like, geez, my migraine frequency went down by 50%. Well, it shows you there's still some underlying problem. So the underlying problem likely is upper cervical instability or breakdown of the cervical curve. Now, when they do studies, they do functional MRIs, they'll find that certain parts of the brain are hyperactive uh, during a migraine. So some of these areas are depicted here, the thalamus cortex, the hypothalamus, the dorsal pons, and different other areas. So I'm just saying that it's likely because of the increased blood flow from the vasodilation, that's why those areas are active. And the cause of that is gonna be irritation in the upper neck, stimulating the trigeminal nerve, causing vasodilation, causing a migraine headache. Now I wanna spend a little bit of time on this figure. I think it's very, very important because this explains the pathophysiology of how ligamentous cervical instability causes all kinds of headaches. Like when you get vagus nerve degener degeneration or compression, remember I said you can get where you feel stuffy or you can get systemic inflammation that can give you an allergy or sinusitis type headache. If the cerebral spinal fluid flow is blocked, you can get just like a constant headache when there's trigeminal nerve irritation, you can get, like we said, migraine headache and cluster headache. When there's upper cervical instability, you can get irritation of the occipital nerve and that gives occipital neuralgia or nerve-related headache. When you have cervical instability, so imagine, th in other words, somebody has ligamentous injury here, that means when they look down the vertebrae could just go forward. The vertebrae would tend to go too far forward and that could injure the spinal cord. So through the ligamentous muscular reflex, the muscles tighten. So when a ligament is stretched too much, there's a nerve reflex to the muscle that causes the muscle to tighten. And that's what causes the chronic muscle tightness that just doesn't go away with massage, vibration, manipulation, adjustments of the vertebrae. You need to resolve the underlying ligamentous instability. Once the ligaments are tight, the muscles don't have to contract all the time to stop the movement of the vertebrae so the vertebrae don't hit the spinal cord or the vagus nerve. If somebody has 
a vertebrae that's stuck in a certain position. That's called a vertebral subluxation complex that can cause a motion type stuck headache. Like they can't move a certain motion and doing a, ver doing a vertebral adjustment is helpful. Cervical medullary compression can give every kind of headache. Brainstem compression can give a nausea headache. And whenever there is a discrepancy between the sympathetic system and the parasympathetic system, you get like an exhaustion headache. That's often caused by vagus nerve degeneration. That's the kind of headache where you're just always tired or if you exert yourself, any kind of exertion or minimal exertion, you just get this awful exhaustion type headache. This just shows that depending on what part of the venous system is dilated that can give you a cerebral venous sinus headache. So let me explain that. 70% of the fluid flow, fluid in the brain is in the vein, 70%. The main port that fluid drains out of the brain is through the internal jugular vein. So 70% of the fluid in the brain is in the venous system. And depending on which part of the venous system is affected by the internal jugular vein compression, which is typically from ligamentous cervical instability, that will give a certain kind of a headache. So for instance, the veins here give a headache here, the veins here, that's on the left side. So in my experience, would typically have jugular vein compression on the left. When the internal jugular veins are compressed, that causes intracranial hypertension because the fluid starts to build up in the brain and that can give headache. So this was a study where they looked at 139 people with idiopathic intracranial hypertension and 68% had migraine or migraine type headache. The other 28% or so had tension type headache. And the, this is where the headaches were. So about 70% of the headaches were in the frontal part of the head. So if you're somebody who just seems like there's always pressure here, uh, it could be that you have internal jugular vein compression and that's why you have the headache. But also it can give posterior headache, ocular headache, and tension in the back of the neck. This also shows the propensity when you have intracranial hypertension for other symptoms. So light sensitivity, what, 70%, 52% or so was sound sensitivity, nausea, vomiting, worsening with physical activity, and other associated symptoms. These are all the people with visual issues. And of course, we know that visual symptoms are very, very common with migraine headaches. And I believe they have a common pathophysiology, which is ligamentous cervical instability, causing intracranial hypertension and trigeminal nerve stimulation and that leads to vasodilation of arteries. You can get vasodilation in the visual cortex and that can lead to uh, visual symptoms. This was a patient that we had. You can see how far forward, see how far forward the neck curve is and then we, when we did curve correction, this is a patient I saw this week. Wow, what a difference in the neck curve, just, just dramatic. So the jugular vein's more open, there's less tension on the vagus nerve, so vagal nerve function's gonna be better. And this kind of a curve puts less tension on the upper cervical spine. So if there is any C1, C2, C3 nerve irritation, it's gonna be lessened here, maybe even be gone, and that's gonna cause uh, more normal functioning of the trigeminal nerve because it's not irritated because of the trigeminal cervical nucleus. And then the, because of that, the person can laugh and stimulate their trigeminal nerve as much as they want. They don't get a migraine headache. This is what it looks like on CT venogram to have an obstructed jugular vein. Here's the jugular vein. You can see how big the jugular vein is there, how narrow it is there. We check jugular vein compression or whether or not it's opened by ultrasound because you can do in the office, you can do an ultrasound with a person laying down, sitting up with their head turned to see if there's any position that 
obstructs the jugular vein, but also a person can get a CT venogram. CT venogram. This is an open jugular vein, what it looks like under ultrasound. And you can see where on E there, it's completely closed off. So depending on how bad the neck curve is, so a curve like this, the jugular vein's open. And then as the curve gets more and more forward, the jugular vein gets more and more compressed. And then these are potential symptoms from internal jugular vein compression. Lots of different after images, lots of visual symptoms can occur because of jugular vein compression. A person can have an unstable visual field, seasickness feeling, dizziness, anxiety, visual snow, which we're gonna talk more about, distorted vision, focusing problems, brain fog, that's a big one. So of course, anyone who has migraine headaches with or without aura and you're saying, geez, I got a lot of these things. Well, those are potential symptoms from internal jugular vein compression. And the internal jugular vein basically takes the blood from the head to the heart. So various kinds of neck injuries can cause the neck vertebrae to change, the neck curve changes or breaks down and then that can eventually cause jugular vein compression. And not only can it cause jugular vein compression, so here again, there's jugular vein compression. You can get from cervical destructure or breakdown of the cervical curve, you can get carotid sheath. So you can get dizziness just from compression of the main artery that takes blood flow to the brain. And of course, your cerebral spinal fluid flow can get blocked. And of course, that can give you any kind of headache. The brain can't drain, it's akin to a clogged toilet. So imagine a person, when they sleep at night, the brain isn't flushing or draining because the jugular veins are compressed. Like there's so many different problems that can occur. And obviously it easily could cause headaches because toxins aren't getting out of the brain. So is the brain more likely in that scenario to be more inflamed or less inflamed? And of course they would be more inflamed. So then the brain tissues suffer from neurogenic inflammation. So you can use drugs to lower the neurogenic inflammation. And I'm not against somebody when they have an acute migraine taking a drug, but a better approach would be to try to address the structural cause of the symptom or migraine. And if the cause is jugular vein compression, then why don't we just do exercises, get the uh, computer system up, you know, do various kinds of exercises for the neck, Anytime, even, even driving in a car, like I was driving my car today, and instead of being like this driving the car, I had my head against the car seat. So even then, I'm exercising the muscles of my neck. So the more your muscles of your neck get strong, that's going to help get a cervical curve. And obviously, having the ligaments strong, that gets, that gets a good cervical curve. Once the jugular veins are open, and they're much more open when a person's laying down, that's why when you take a power nap and the brain flushes, like the toxins go out of the brain, the brain literally is like a washing machine, it flushes, then you just feel like unbelievable, right? After a five or 10 minute nap. And some of the patients with migraines or and or intracranial hypertension. I have them five minutes every hour laying down so the brain drains. Now, if a person says I lay down and I don't feel better, it might be that you're laying in the wrong position. So to induce a cervical curve, sometimes you have to lay on your side. So I would try different sides. Typically, when you have a right-sided migraine, the position that you should lay down is, is on your right side and looking at the back wall. So obviously, you know, a lot of people, when you lay on your side, you know, you're like this, but that's gonna, you know, again, if I'm, if I'm laying down like this, I, my neck curve is reversed. So imagine if I'm laying down in bed and I go like this, well, I'm helping the neck curve. So I'm 
causing the internal jugular vein to be in a relaxed position, which makes it more likely to be open. So try, if you have right-sided migraines, try laying on your right side with your neck up. And if it's real bad, when I say neck up, I just mean that you're looking at the back wall because normally we're looking at our feet, right? And if you have left-sided migraines, do the opposite and try not to have your head rotated. And often that is going to make you feel so much better. So how we assess somebody is we do a digital motion x-ray. So we we see, do they have instability? So this is an open mouth view. So, you know, and then we see the atlas and the axis. Is there displacement of the atlas on the axis? And if there is, we measure it. That's a test that can document looseness or instability. The other good thing about digital motion x-ray, if you think about it, is imagine somebody has two segments when they flex the vertebrae and they're totally together. And then the next level, it goes down by three millimeters. Well, obviously, the person's own vertebrae is their control. So that you can tell like a difference between vertebral segments. Then the treatment to tighten those ligaments is called prolotherapy. And I just put this on here to know that there's many different reasons that the jugular vein or the vagus nerve might get stretched and compressed. There's the TMJ obviously affects the trigeminal nerve. So if somebody had, say, right-sided migraines, you have to look at, is there popping, clicking, grinding of the TMJ? And if there is, the TMJ joint probably has to be treated by prolotherapy. The hyoid bone, the hyoid bone is supposed to be at the level of C3. If you're a mouth breather and during the day, your tongue is in the base of your mouth, the tongue is supposed to be on the roof of the mouth. The muscles of the tongue, they attach to the hyoid. See, the problem is if your hyoid bone is low because the muscles of the tongue aren't doing anything, you know, like the, the tongue is on the, in the mandible on the base and your hyoid bone goes low. There's muscles that attach to the hyoid bone that can block the jugular vein. So we test, if we change the configuration of your mandible or we have your tongue on the roof of the mouth, does the jugular vein open? And sometimes the, it can be as simple as that. The person just has to work at putting the tongue on the roof of the mouth. Obviously, if somebody has clicking, popping, grinding in the thoracic spine, they have a reversal of the neck curve. We address those things with curve correction and exercise. And again, this shows that the jugular vein is getting compressed, not just by the atlas, which is C1, but see this, the styloid bone. So some people have compression of the jugular vein by the styloid bone. And I'd encourage anybody that's interested in the styloid bone to look at the various videos that I made on Eagle syndrome or elongated styloid. This is an MRI that shows blockage of the cerebral spinal fluid flow. See on the axial view, the white there. See how the white is, there's no white over here. So this is the vertebrae, this is the spinal cord. So there's a CSF block there. And you could see here, from disc protrusions or osteophyte complexes here, here, here. So this particular person, we would help them get a cervical curve, tighten the ligaments here, do various exercises, and often this is open. These things get open. It's very seldom that somebody needs a decompressive surgery or a fusion surgery. So anybody who's contemplating that, I'd really recommend, please get an evaluation by a doctor that's skilled in prolotherapy because we prevent a lot of people from getting various surgeries. And even surgeons nowadays would say, you know, why don't you exhaust conservative treatments? And one of the conservative treatments to consider is prolotherapy. But blockage of CSF can also give you that head pressure. It can increase intracranial pressure. And remember, when you have intracranial hypertension, when the brain pressure goes up,
the brain by auto regulation can dilate the arteries. So it isn't just trigeminal nerve stimulation that dilates the arteries in the brain. When your brain pressure goes up, the brain pressure can go up so high that the brain is nervous that the high pressure is gonna cause the arteries to collapse. In the office, how we document intracranial hypertension, we look at several variables. One of them is optic nerve sheath diameter. When the optic nerve sheath diameter is over six millimeters, in other words, there's fluid around the eye nerve, that correlates with having high brain pressure, so that's one. We also measure arterial flow, so we measure flow through the middle cerebral arteries. That's the largest branch of the internal carotid artery, and it's very common in our migraine patients and headache patients that we find that the velocities are over 100 centimeters per second when they really should be about 65. Then we look at pulsatile index, so in other words, how much resistance is there to dilation of the artery. And when you have intracranial hypertension, there's just a lot of resistance. So you can, by non-invasive testing, like just with ultrasound or tr transcranial Doppler ultrasound, you can document that a person has intracranial hypertension and intracranial hypertension is a known cause of vasodilation. And by showing that the arteries are dilated, well, obviously that's gonna be really, really helpful because now you, you have a structural basis that the person's migraines or their other headache is actually from the neck because the ultrasound exam would show the internal jugular vein compression. And then as the internal jugular veins become more open, the arterial blood flow gets back to normal. So it goes, like we've had them even high, as high as 200 centimeters per second. So as the neck curve gets corrected, jugular veins get open, the arterial flow gets back to normal. There's no more vasodilation, of course, that generally correlates with the migraine frequency going down. And as I've said, I've had people for years and years and years not uh, have migraines. Now, one of the things that's new is that the FDA has approved vagus nerve stimulation for chronic migraines and cluster headaches. So they've shown that vagus nerve stimulation can decrease migraine frequency prevalence. It can be preventative. And one of the ways a person can document is there a vagus nerve problem is actually measuring the cross-sectional area of the vagus nerve. Vagus nerve is in the same sheath as the carotid artery and the jugular vein. A healthy cross-sectional area of the vagus nerve would be typically like two and a half millimeters squared. And like I had mentioned before, that's what a vagus nerve stimulator looks like. So the vagus nerve innervates the skin inside the ear so you can stimulate various parts of the ear and that stimulates the vagus nerve and they've shown that that decreases migraine frequency and intensity. So the question is, if you stimulate the vagus nerve and it decreases migraine intensity and frequency, well maybe vagus nerve degeneration is a cause or a contributing factor for migraine frequency and intensity. So that's why we do some vagus nerve tests in our neck patients, especially those with migraine. And what we find is typically the vagus nerves are much smaller because of stretch and compression from the breakdown of the cervical curve because of ligamentous injury. And also heart rate variability is low. So anybody with migraines, I'd really recommend you check your heart rate variability. And there's easy ways to increase heart rate variability, such as listening to pleasant music, symphony music, and yeah, really calming music, heart music, laughing, hugging, being outside, joyful things. Please be aware of what you see, 
what you say and what you hear and how it affects your vagal tone or your heart rate variability. And this just shows that when you stimulate the vagus nerve, there's so many wonderful things that happen to the brain. And like I said, vagus nerve stimulation has been FDA approved. I mean, it's been shown that it decreases migraine frequency and intensity. So anybody with chronic migraines, that might be an easy temporary solution to decreasing the amount of migraines that a person has. Before I talk about visual snow and visual snow symptoms, I wanted to go through the process of how to determine where a symptom or a disease is coming from. So the process of determining which ligamentous joint instability is causing my condition, like how, how does a person do that? Well, one, you have to know Hauser's Law. Two, understand the neurology of the condition. Three, find which joints could affect the neurology. Do I have ligamentous joint instability and correct the ligamentous joint instability and its aftermath? So Hauser's Law is when the etiology of the symptoms are elusive or a symptom is elusive, following the neurology and it will lead to ligamentous joint instability as the cause. So before we go into migraines, I'm gonna go through a case that I saw yesterday. So a young gentleman came to see me with a lot of different symptoms, but he felt like the first symptom that he would get before his body would cave in is he would get a, he'd get a, a pain right here. So he'd get a pain right here. So there's a pain right here. So then the next question I asked him do you have clicking or popping like in the ribs? And the person said, yes. Then I said, do you have muscle tension like around here in the same location in the thoracic spine? And he said, yes. And then I said, you know, obviously he was coming to the Hauser neck center, so he had neck tension too. So in other words, he has some pain here. The nerves from right here go into the thoracic area. So that's why I asked, it could be that he has thoracic instability causing the intercostal nerve to be affected. So that's where the thoracic nerve. So you follow the neurology and the neurology typically will lead to ligamentous joint instability or in this case, the person likely will need some prolotherapy into the loose connections on the rib and then some prolotherapy in the lower thoracic area. So let's figure out using Hauser's Law the structural cause of migraines. So Hauser's Law again is when the etiology of symptoms are elusive following the neurology it will lead to ligamentous joint instability as the cause. The neurology of migraines involves the brain especially vasodilation of the arteries in the brain. Trigeminal nerve stimulation and intracranial hypertension cause vasodilation of arteries in the brain. Vagus nerve stimulation is known to decrease migraine intensity and frequency, so maybe vagus nerve degeneration is involved. So then we have three different mechanisms by which a person might have migraines. Trigeminal nerve stimulation, intracranial hypertension, vagus nerve degeneration. So is there a joint instability that's associated with all three? So number four, ligamentous cervical instability, especially upper cervical instability, can affect the trigeminal nerves, the brain pressures, and the vagus nerves via compression of the internal jugular veins, vagus nerves, and I would even add the C1, C2, C3 cervical nerves. Thus, there is a ligamentous cervical instability that could cause all the different structural reasons why somebody gets migraines. So possible therapies involve upper cervical chiropractic care, cervical curve correction, and prolotherapy. Like that's how we would treat it at uh, the Hauser Neck Center. This is from a study, it says visual snow syndrome, the spectrum of perceptual disorders and migraine as a common risk factor. This just kind of shows that with migraines, you get all kinds of things, including auditory processing issues, visual processing issues, vestibular processing, and even pain processing issues. 
visual snow syndrome. I wanted to do this associated with migraines because I could have just done migraines, migraines with aura, but there's lots of people, and I'm sure lots of people watching this, you have something's going on with your vision and you just don't know what it is or what's causing it or what you can do about it. And it's not commonly known, even by physicians, that cervical instability and neck problems can affect vision. And it primarily does it by fluid around the eye nerve because you don't see, you don't see something until the electrical impulse from your eye gets transmitted by a cable, which is the optic nerve, to the visual centers of your brain, which are primarily in the occipital lobe. So imagine your cable system under the ground that gives the TV signal uh, so, you, so you can watch TV. Imagine that cable is broken or there's too much pressure on it. You're going to get a staticky image. So that's visual snow is the image, but there's all these static or snow-like particles. The snow is superimposed on the visual scene and there is not a loss of visual acuity nor a visual field defect. So in other words, you see the full visual field, but there's like dots or it's bright. Symptoms are persistent for greater than three months and not explained by another disorder. Common associated other visual symptoms with visual snow syndrome are after images, trail phenomenon like you see it's almost like the image is, is like a trail it keeps following sensitivity to bright lights impaired night vision increased awareness of entopic phenomenon visual perception within eye itself like floaters etiology currently unknown but thought to be due, due to a combination of peripheral thoracic and cortical dysfunction. Now, I do a lot of videos on intracranial hypertension. So whenever you see on the internet or research where it says there seems to be a br brain problem using Hauser's Law. So let's say uh, somebody had like all of a sudden they're impulsive or a child's personality has changed and you're using Hauser's Law, you would say, well, what ligamentous joint instability caused that? Well, it's a brain problem. The fluid going into and out of the brain goes through the neck. So maybe my child or I have a neck problem. So that would be like the first place to look at if there's been a sudden change of personality or a symptom, like all of a sudden for no apparent reason, somebody becomes anxious or depressed. Right, so using Hauser's Law, you'd say, well, maybe my brain pressure acutely became high because I have ligamentous joint instability in my neck, and of course, digital motion x-ray should be done to evaluate that. So this is good. You see normal vision here. This is kind of what visual snow looks like. Like, it's not as crisp. You can see the full visual field. There's not like a black spot. It just looks like as if you're looking at something through snow, little snowy dots. There's lots of different proposed criterion for visual snow syndrome. I talked about much of it. It's basically you have that kind of field of vision. You might have other uh, visual symptoms and it's persisted for greater than three months. Now it says symptoms are not consistent with typical migraine with visual aura. In other words, it isn't from a migraine, though migraines with visual aura can occur with visual snow syndrome, but they are two separate disorders. This, again, is another way where it talks about the various criterion for visual snow syndrome for people who are interested. And then this just explains that typically when they do functional brain MRIs, they find that there's certain areas of the brain where there's hyperactivity. So we would expect what? It probably relates to the visual cortex. And as I already explained, that blood flow can change a lot when there's changes in pressure inside the brain. And you might say, yeah, but one day my vision is very good and another day it's not so good. So what would cause that? Well, it's probably the amount of vasodilation in your brain changes based on the pressure. The pressure changes 
based on how much jugular vein compression there is. So obviously when you have ligamentous injury in the neck, there are going to be days where the bones move a lot, like the atlas moves a lot, blocks the jugular vein a lot. That would be a day where the visual snow syndrome is very bad or the migraine headaches are very bad. Then there can be other times where a person's not doing as much. Maybe they got a good night's sleep. Um, the atlas is in a good position. It's not subluxed. The muscles are there's some tension there but it's holding the atlas in a good position there's not as much jugular vein compression not as much vasodilation of the arteries in the brain not as much fluid around the eye nerve so then that person says geez i had a really really good day i had a really really good day this is with 1100 people with visual snow syndrome and it talks about the uh, distribution is mostly female. Visual snow syndrome is 2.7 times more likely when somebody has migraines also, and it's 2.1 times more likely if somebody has tinnitus. And you can see here, a lot of times visual snow syndrome also occurs in childhood. So that's similar to migraines. So it's true, like somebody could be eight years old or 10 years old, and then you know, the child's complaining like their vision isn't so good. This, this is kind of interesting. I had a patient yesterday, a new patient, who told me they have like 10 or 12 different pair of glasses because every single time when they go in, the prescription changes. So if that's you, I'm just telling you, the cervical instability can affect vision in so many ways, and I've done... YouTube videos on this, but it can affect the pupil size. It can affect the pressure inside the eye, the intraocular pressure. It can affect, like I said, the transmission of the image. So if you're somebody who every time you go into the ophthalmologist, optometrist, and your prescription's changing all the time, you really got to look into ligamentous cervical instability. So this was another study on 120 Patients with visual snow, 70% had migraines and 32% had migraines with aura. Lots of them had POTS, tinnitus, depression, anxiety. So these are all symptoms and conditions that are common with ligamentous cervical instability. Visual snow syndrome, this is again a further delineation of the 1100 cases. The average age was 29. 40% had symptoms as long as they could remember. So that means in childhood. They most commonly experience static. There's a very high prevalence of people suffer with migraines and or tinnitus. The migraine and tinnitus correlated with more severe symptoms. And you see like, wow, look at all the different, um, the different other symptoms that related to the eye, like we had talked about with migraine, like flashes, uh, after images, like you look at an image, then you turn away, but you still see that image. Photophobia, which is fearful of bright lights or sensitivity to bright lights and problems with nighttime vision. And this just explains what some of the, like what after images is F. So that would be here. That's what an after image looks like. So all these things can occur because of ligamentous cervical instability and are associated with migraines. There's lots of different ways that ligaments get injured. If somebody gets too forceful of a turning of the head, and that can be when a person hits their head. It can be even a person hit their head on a cabinet. I've had people come in where they had a dental procedure and they were stuck in a certain position for like an hour. Or I've even had people who go to the beautician, to the hair salon, and they are washing their hair, but they're over the sink, and then they end up getting ligamentous cervical instability. People who get too forceful of a manipulation or if people are self-manipulators, that can cause ligament injury. But honestly, I think the number one cause of ligamentous injury is just looking down at a cell phone for hours because when you look down at a cell phone or you look in front of a computer, it stretches all the ligaments. Once it stretches the ligaments and the neck curve changes, the jugular vein gets blocked 
and the jugular vein getting blocked or compressed, that causes fluid flow in the brain to slow. When the fluid flow in the brain slows, the cerebral spinal fluid accumulates in different parts. So if the cerebral spinal fluid accumulates in the frontal lobe, you know, where the frontal lobe part of the brain is, the frontal lobe doesn't work quite right. And the frontal lobe of the brain is involved in higher cognitive functioning, problem solving, high level reading, doing a task in a very quick manner. So if you're somebody who has visual snow or migraine headaches and you're just having a hard time at work, like just focusing or concentrating. Well, it may be that you have uh, increased brain pressure, which is pressing on a certain part of the brain, like the frontal lobe. If the fluid accumulates around the eye nerve, that's where you get the image that goes into your eye to the retina. So the image goes to the retina, you have blurry vision. So you go to the ophthalmologist or the optometrist and they say, no, 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 the eye's fine. They're telling you, correct, the eye's fine. It's just that the image quality, by the time it gets to the brain, it's all distorted because there's increased pressure around the eye nerve. And we can see that on ultrasound of the eye nerve. So, and then we measure the diameter of the optic nerve, which is the eye nerve. And if it's really large, well, then you know you have extra fluid around it. We document ligamentous cervical instability by digital motion x-ray. And this was a patient who had multi-level instability in the neck. Typically, people have conditions and diseases and symptoms. So they see doctors for the various diseases and conditions and symptoms. Often medications are given for this, but if there's a structural cause, of course, a medication isn't gonna work. And often, and again, I'm a chronic disease doctor, if you will, like people, I've been doing this for 30 years. So for 30 years, I've had one objective as a doctor, and that was always to try to cure the problem or to try to, help the person get resolution of the symptoms and the disease. And when there's a structural cause, you have to treat the disease structurally. And often the chemistry of the body is screwed up, even in autoimmune disease, because of a structural problem. And the most common structural problem that we see is upper and lower cervical instability. And again, all kinds of problems can occur when somebody sits with poor posture in front of a computer. This particular person, the computer, see when the computer is up and you raise your chest, like right now my lower back's contracted, my abs are contracted, my neck's contracted. So I'm using my muscles and not straining the ligaments versus like if I go like this and I slouch a little bit, well now I'm straining the ligaments in my neck, I'm straining the ligaments in my back. The back also has a lordotic curve as the neck does. And of course, eventually that's gonna cause ligamentous injury. And then this is one of our patients who took a picture of him at work. So you can imagine hours and hours and hours uh, that's gonna cause ligament injury. And as the head goes forward, the weight on the ligaments becomes greater and greater. Like if you actually look at it, there's like over a million pounds of force on the ligaments of your neck every day. When you, when you uh, look down at a cell phone, it's like, it's unbelievable because you gotta realize that's occurring every second of every day when you're like this, where when you go like this, there's almost no pressure on the ligaments. Like when your head's balanced on your neck, and the weight of the head is behind the curve. So in other words, with a curve like this, the weight of the head's gonna be behind the curve, so there's almost no pressure on the ligaments. When you go 15 degrees, now there's 27 pounds, 40 pounds, you know, 60 pounds, and it's every minute, every day, and some people are in front of a computer or a cell phone like, you know, 14 hours a day, and then you just get all kinds of instabilities in the neck. I wanted to put this in here that this was from Dr. 
Henderson, he gave a presentation. And it just shows there are going to be people who they have such severe cervical instability that they need an upper cervical fusion. So this is just an honest assessment of a bunch of patients. And you can see overall the patients got headache pain relief, but as it relates to average headache pressure at five years, there wasn't anybody who was totally pain free. There are times that you need surgery, but even from this data, you'd say, well, you should maybe consider trying to uh, do, do more conservative care like curve correction and prolotherapy. And then if that doesn't quite resolve the headache pain and there's extensive uh, instability, then, then and only then, you know, consider getting a surgery. Because even at five years, lot, so look at at five years, which is the gray, look at all the people that had a pain level of a five out of 10, six out of 10, seven out of 10, eight out of 10, nine out of 10, 10 out of 10. And I think my office and other offices included can learn a lot from Dr. Uh, Henderson of just how following patients over a long period of time. Uh, so prolotherapy involves injections to tighten and thicken ligaments. It's used to get rid of chronic pain and instability, and that's the main treatment that we use in the office for resolving cervical instability. And we document the cervical instability by digital motion x-ray. And about every three prolotherapy visits, we then retest with a digital motion x-ray to see how the instability is doing. And then various studies have shown good results with prolotherapy in our office and other offices are uh, documenting the response to prolotherapy. Typically prolotherapy is a series of treatments. Depending on how severe the instability and the symptoms are, it can be anywhere from, I've had patients where I tell them it's gonna be a year's worth of care you know, eight to 13 visits and other people, it's three to six visits. So based on the symptoms and how bad the instability is, we'll determine how many prolotherapy sessions. A common question I get asked is, well, how soon will I feel better? Generally, after the first visit, two out of three people with migraine say they're better. After the second visit, three out of four. And after the third visit, four out of five. And that's just, uh, my experience over 30 years and sometimes it does take some time because you have to correct the neck structure and tighten the ligaments visual things i've had patients where right away their vision is better but realize if there's been a little bit of damage of the eye nerve you have to get the pressure off of the eye nerve from the fluid and then the eye nerve has to repair so sometimes visual symptoms take longer but the, in my experience, the treatment has been excellent to get rid of headaches. I would say headaches are one of the symptoms that responds the best to prolotherapy are headaches, all the different kinds of headaches. So it's a, just a common, common condition that doctors who do prolotherapy see on a regular basis. Two or three months ago, Haley's totally fine. Like she's in school, doing yes. well. Schooled five days a week, and she's a swimmer, so she has two a days almost, okay. almost every day during the school week, and then practice on Saturday as well. And and she's a breaststroker. She's a breaststroker, and she competes. She has meets. She swims on the high school team and clubs, so she has meets during the evenings, uh, during the week, and then. Um, Was she on, doing really well? She was doing pretty well. Yeah. I, but uh, she liked it. She loved it. And okay. um, it, there were just some signs and symptoms that something wasn't quite right. So Definitely. explain that. Explain um, that. Her energy level seemed to really decrease pretty rapidly. Um, she has IBS and it had gotten more severe and her um, kind of bouts with it were getting more frequent right okay. before the onset of the migraines. Okay. Now, she seemed to indicate to me that she had some neck pain or neck she, thing, but prior to the migraine starting, did she ever receive care for any sort of neck pain or headaches? Like, had she ever seen a chiropractor or this or that? And she'd, 
No, not seen a chiropractor okay. and really didn't complain of like cracking and popping. Definitely muscle tightness. Okay. But as a swimmer that swims six days a week, yeah. they're tight all over the place. So yeah. yeah. Did did you ever see her cracking her neck or no? I would see her more like stretching, kind of okay. doing slow stretches. Okay. Um, with breaststroke, there's quite an emphasis on head position. Okay. And it is a quick movement and then it's chin to the chest um, for part of it. So it's like all the time she's... Con like you know that's like basically with the breaststroke right and then uh, she's a teenager so for school her life is on a laptop or an ipad or her phone yeah that makes sense yeah. so, and she admitted that when i yeah. did talk to her <laughs> yes. and then uh part of the reason why you're here too is that you know even the medications that she was prescribed by the other doctors like they don't seem to be working no. plus you guys really want to try to get at the root cause of it, right? Absolutely, because okay. I feel like a lot of what the neurologists, the endocrinologists are throwing at us is just masking symptoms. It's not okay. dealing with any kind of root cause at all. Okay. Sometimes what it is is somebody, for instance, somebody could have a structure that makes you more prone to getting migraines, but other people with that structure don't necessarily have right. migraines. But then you put on top of that that she even the medication that she's on for the irritable bowel could make her more prone to getting headaches. So we'll talk about that. Right. And then three is if, like, like for instance, if a child or a teenager, they don't have like a normal menstrual cycle, yeah. then obviously there can be hormonal things that again, make somebody more prone to migraines. And then when you're on a kind of a restricted diet, cause a lot of people, kids, you know, kids tend to anyway only eat certain kind of foods but right. but but the problem is the body needs you know a certain kind of a diet and then so her and I started that conversation so it's probably like a combination of like a half a dozen things that culminated to where to 2 months yeah. ago or whatever it just you know the body you know is, is struggling and i always think of a symptom is the body crying out, I need help. So yes. the problem is, if you just give a medicine for a symptom, you negate the body making you aware that there's a ma there could be a major problem. Right, and as you well know, being a doctor yourself, there's very little um, introspective look into what are what is the body crying for? What is it looking for? What yeah. does it need? And she has a myriad of weird symptoms that you know, that are just not being addressed, so. I think you're wise to bring her in, get to a clinic like this sooner rather than later, because as you know, like, yes. I'm the often the doctor of last resort where I sort of wish I was sometimes more the doctor of first resort instead right. of last resort. Oh, and that's why we're so grateful to get here quickly because mm -hmm. um, there just isn't any answer that yeah. we can find. Right and then now. think about like, she now she can't do swimming, yeah. she can't go to school, she can't, no. like, you know, there's a lot of, it has an escalating effect and it's all negative. Right, yeah. and it impacts her greatly emotionally mm -hmm. and yeah, yeah. that does not help Anything. us get any through get right. through any of this. Right, right, so, right. Yeah. I've been your doctor what, about six months, something like that? Mm -hmm. Five or six months. So why don't you explain why what led you eventually to come to caring medical? I've always struggled with the headaches and the migraines, and then... Um, like what age did they start? Five. Since age five or six, you've had like migraines or headaches? Mm -hmm. And all the symptoms that come with it. Like what? Um, nausea, um, sensitive to light, the stiffness in the neck, things like that. So you've seen like a hundred doctors and lots of medications? Yes, and lots of tests. Yeah, and they never could really find much? No, and then um, 2019, I had the QR malformation decompression surgery, and that was that helped me for about a year, and then all the symptoms came back. Let me ask you this, like, what were the symptoms that you were hopeful that the Chiari surgery was going to decrease or get rid of? Um, I was having severe headaches, migraines every day, and then just like, my I was really dizzy, have like the floaters and things like that. So nausea, I just couldn't, I mean, I was just in my bed all the time. Like you had like head pressure all the time. Mm -hmm. Like kind of describe your life that you had at that time. Like were you getting, <clears throat> starting to get hopeless? Yes, very, very. Crying um, a lot? Um, 
A little bit. We had just got married, okay. and all I could do was um, go to work, and I was on um, 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 must relaxer the whole time I was at work, and then I'd come home and take pain pills and go to sleep, and that was my life. Okay. And then uh, what made you think, well, maybe you should come to Caring Medical? My mom found you, and um, you had all these success stories, and you actually listened to me and your patients, which I hadn't gotten in the past. Okay. They just were just like, we don't know what to do. And so I found you, and the rest is history. <laughs> I know. Let's talk about, like, other symptoms. Like, how was, how's your digestion? How's your vision? Like, um, like, you know, when you first came. When I first came, I was having, like, the visual snow almost 24-7, which and also made my headaches worse because I couldn't see anything. <laughs> and then digestion, um, super nauseous all the time, and that's gone away tremendously. That, so you've had, you had light sensitivity, too? Yes. Mm -hmm. Did your eyes hurt? Yes. Okay. And then, when like, tell us what your job is. I work as for a government contractor for contract administration, it's computer all day. Yeah, you're on, yeah. that's what I mean. Yes. Like you're on the computer all yes. day. So it must have been hard. Like you're actually, like try to describe in detail what you were actually seeing. It was just like spots that just floating and stuff. And I couldn't really like focus because it was always trying to look somewhere else. Like it was dark or it was white or it was both? Um, a little bit of both. Okay. So it was almost like, well, let's just say like I was here and there was a big snowstorm and you're trying to see me, like you could kind of see me, but there's something blocking the mm -hmm. view. And blurry, a lot of times some blurriness too. And it would come and go to right, the mm -hmm. severity of it? It would. So what happened uh, after prolotherapy? Like, like when did you start feeling better, like right away or it took like several months? Um, I've noticed small things right away, but um, I think at right around treatment three is when the visual stuff went away for the most part okay so you you can see me fine mm -hmm. a am i handsome or yes oh, okay no i'm just joking <laughs> but now your husband's handsome isn't he you got a great ha you have a great husband don't you i do <laughs> wasn't it like you know you were having all those health things and man he stuck by you he did the whole yeah. time yeah he's a great guy uh the okay so when you're at work so can you work a full day i can and then how's the vision at the end of the day now it's i mean i don't i very rarely have the lot sensitivity and the in the snow anymore okay awesome and then how's your stomach it's much better i don't have to take as much soap in anymore <laughs> that's good prior to coming did you have to be really careful with what you ate mm-hmm and then how is that now? Can you introduce foods now that you weren't able to introduce before? Um, I don't have to be as cautious anymore, you okay. know, so. Is there some food that you now can eat and you don't really have an issue, like can you eat a pizza or? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I can eat a pizza, Mexican food, it doesn't matter. <laughs> so it's good. Mm -hmm. Like you can, you guys can go out to eat and you can have fun and you can. Yes, yes. Now you had several different kinds of headaches, didn't you? Like you had the overall head pressure, then you would get these really severe migraines. Yes. So how, how has that been? How have those been? Um, I, so used to, like a migraine would put me down for about a week. Okay. And now it may be a day, and I'm, I probably haven't had one in two months. Okay. So obviously the fear of getting a migraine, that's starting to go away, right? Because yes. it wasn't it like... You would fear like every day, like you mm -hmm. could never be. Mm -hmm. and I couldn't make, you know, couldn't make any plans or play with my son because it would, might could trigger, like a certain movement would trigger it or, you okay. know, just the fear of it just happening out. How old's your son? Three. Okay, and then, well, can you just be with him and just be like a normal mom? Yes, the only thing I have to watch is, um, like bending down to pick something up or like looking under the couch. <laughs> okay. But otherwise, mm -hmm. can you crawl on the floor with him? I can. No, that's got to make you happy, yes. right? He calms all over me. <laughs> that's good. Yes. Like that's good. And then probably you're like, you know, you're smiling. You're probably smiling a lot more now. Mm -hmm. I feel like more present. Okay. Not just in pain constantly. Do you take any medicine? Like, do you take any medicine regularly? And what were you taking before you started Prolo? 
Um, so I was probably taking Tylenol around the clock. Okay. Um, something stronger if I needed it. Like what? What would you take that was stronger? Like when you got a bad migraine or? Um, so they would give, they've given me Tramadol in the past and um, they tried uh, the, the shots, all the Trulicity and all those things and pain pills. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then uh, are you on any medicines now? Um, I still take the Muscle Relaxer. Yeah, which one do you take? Uh, Flexreal. Okay. And um, I'm going to try to wean off that soon. And then I barely, rarely have to take Tylenol anymore. So oh. it was like all day. I couldn't oh. leave the house without it. Okay. And then uh, any other symptoms that you had, uh, you know, that went away or obviously probably the anxiety, mm. depression. Um, I'm not dizzy okay. anymore. I would just get dizzy spells. Um, that's gone away. A lot of the neck stiffness and things through here, it's gone away. Awesome. Did you make some adjustments? Like, did you make adjustments with your computer station or the way you sleep? And then do you yes. do any exercises? Yeah, so I raised my computer up and also have a standing desk now as well. Okay. And then um, sleeping, I uh, sleep more on my left side with my head tilted up. So. Okay. And, so you uh, change your sleeping position after we tested yes. you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you do anything else for your health that's helping you get your life back? I started exercising last week. I was able to for the first time. Yeah, so explain that. So you, you probably had an exercise for years, right? Mm -mm, not. I, um, so I was able... I just like to go on walks. So I was able to start walking again last week. And I oh, great. Three times last week. Oh, awesome. Like with your family or? I did. I took um, me and my friend, we walk, and I took Marshall with me once, and then Nathan and I went on a walk oh, as well. Oh, fantastic. Mm -hmm. But thank you so much. And <laughs> I, you. you're here. I guess you're going to get one, one more treatment or something. Uh, are you ready? Yeah. Okay. It's a little very sweet. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, believe it or not, one of the first patients I ever treated with prolotherapy for migraine headaches was actually my new wife or my when I was married just a few years to my wonderful wife, Marion. So we were married in uh, 1986, then in 1993, you know, we I started working with Dr. Hamwa right. and then, you know, basically one of the first patients I treated with terrible headaches was you and I Think, I almost think our fir my first treatment of you was actually in the house. Like we actually, I treated you in, in our apart, in our condominium. But why don't you explain how from your youth you had headaches and you had... Um, I didn't have them in youth. Well, you had, you had menstrual. I, I, had, I had menstrual cramps. Sometimes they would be headaches with those, yeah. With yeah. The cramps were way worse than the headaches, but... Yeah, I guess I forgot about that. Like, I did have menstrual headaches. You would um, miss a day of school every But that was from month. the cramps. Yeah. yeah. Well, but sometimes you would get terrible headaches yeah, with that. In high school. So that turned out to be, you know, like endometriosis. So that was a bad, bad situation. Um, and then when I, uh, I went to undergrad, then I went to uh, grad school. And then, you know, there's lots of writing of papers and studying and things. So I, you know, at the time, I'm, I don't know what happened, but then... We got married after I finished grad school, and you were still in training. And uh, you know, there was just a lot of stress. It's just, it was a stressful time. You know, buying a condo, studying for my board exam. You know, going to grad school, all that. So, I never. You know, I guess looking back at it now, you don't really realize what actually was the cause of it. So it probably was like a lot of the, you know, head down from all the studying and and typing and all of that combined with some other things that we ended up finding out so it wasn't only just a structural thing so when i talk about what the headaches were like uh so we got married you know and it's our you know we just you know we're newly married together and you know you're supposed to be in this blissful time and these headaches would just seemingly come on out of nowhere like you know we remember we'd be going to like a wedding or to out to dinner with friends or something and then all of a sudden I'd be like, uh, I can't go. Like, I can't, I can't have any light on me. It, and my headaches were like in the back of the head, like back in the shoulders and then going up the back of the head and then, you know, to the front and then had to be in a dark room, sometimes nauseated. Um, 
and then it would just totally ruin like a whole evening into the whole next weekend. day. Yeah, and so that got really frustrating. And so you know, you didn't um, you didn't get to where you were seeing Dr. Hemwell and learning about prolotherapy for you know a few more years. You yes, know? So well, it was like seven six, years, six more six years, or seven yeah. years. So I mean, for those years, I had that and really couldn't figure out what what was wrong. And I was working at the hospital as a dietitian at the time, and I remember going to. <laughs> The, yeah, doctor. The insurance in the plan doctor, and um, he, it was just a horrible, horrible experience. You know, he didn't examine me, he didn't touch me, he didn't do anything. I was there after work, kind of rushed over there, and then uh, he didn't take my blood pressure, nothing. Asked me, like, how's your sex life? Are you a happy person? Like, those kind of questions. And then he, like, writes me a prescription for propranolol, which is off-label use of a you know anti-hypertensive medication and and my use for migraine but it's headaches yeah but it's used for headaches but it's an off-label use for for high blood pressure and you know at the time my blood pressure was running like 100 over 60 you know so that would not be something i should be taking so i remember leaving there and just like tearing that up and saying wow that was a waste you know well you felt disrespected too totally disrespected. you just saw you were like a depressed newly married female so you know, that was the cause of your migraine headaches. Like mm-hmm. he didn't, yeah. Yeah, no no investigation into right. what might like, be causing it. When do they come on or what happens or anything like that. And then the answer is just, you know, give a prescription. And I'm sure a lot of our patients have are still, I mean, this was years ago, but I'm, I'm sure that that's still happening today where people just go to their their primary care and then they, they just, all they're getting is a prescription. And people don't want that, I don't want that. Like, I don't wanna be taking something. And you take those meds and they like, they conk you out. You can't function, you can't drive, you know? So, you know, that's that wasn't an option for me. And then you received prolotherapy. Do you remember how many prolotherapies of your neck that you got? Yeah. No, I remember uh, what happened. So we went to a prolotherapy conference in Madison, Wisconsin. 1993. With Hackett Hemwell yeah. Foundation. And, uh, you know, obviously Dr. Hemwell was there and y- you were newly connecting with him. And uh, so I had headaches and so they wanted volunteers. So that's back in the day when they would treat people at these seminars. And, uh, yes, yeah, so that was my first treatment. Mm-hmm. So I was there with all the doctors all around. And I remember he hit like a blood vessel or something. So I ended up having like a bruise on my neck, okay. like a big one. And um, I had to go back to work the next day. So that was like, oh my gosh, what happened to you? But anyway, so that was the first one. And then the second one was actually in his office. And the reason I remember that, uh, I think, I think, yeah, you had started working there, obviously. Um, but, you know, the, the practice hadn't really gotten going yet. And he he was going to do it, that second one. Okay. And I don't know if you guys, if the readers or the viewers know about Dr. Hemwell, but he would often give like 100 milligrams of Demerol to pretty much anybody, no matter if you weighed 100 pounds or 300 pounds. And he wanted everybody to be still. And you and I were talking about that the other day. He's, he's a uh, surgeon, so you know that was like a nothing to him. And this is just in a regular old office. This isn't like any kind yeah. of crash cart or anything. So I remember he gave me that. I never had it. And then, of course, I realized that I'm overly sensitive to it, and I'll never get that ever again. But anyway, that was my second treatment. And um, then after that, uh, you subsequently treated me. So I think the total was just four. Okay. And then over the years, you know, I had like a couple tune-ups here and there. But, I mean, we're talking a long time ago. Like going from Well, it's like almost 30 years ago, because 1983 totally to 2023 de- de- is 20, 30 years. It. Yeah. And, you know, I've talked about my bike crash that I yeah. had. So when I crashed my bike, you know, a few years ago, you know, I landed on the right side and I hit my head and I had road rash here. I did not develop uh, headaches again, but I, I ended up getting like some clicking and, and in this shoulder and on this side. So I ended up getting a partial neck treatment for that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, and I'm at the computer a lot and I'm... Uh, I'm, uh, you know, on my phone and doing all the things that we're not supposed to do. I'm working really hard at my posture and, mm-hmm. um, you know, trying to make sure that my curve is good. And I, I have, I don't have any headaches. I mean, I, I don't I get any kind of headaches. When, so, when do you think the last time you had a migraine headache, like the pulsatile boom, boom, boom? I, I mean, I can't like, even remember. Like it went 20 from years like obsessing, ago. You know, like you know, probably like 20 years yeah, ago. Yeah, no, I, I don't, I don't get them at all. 
But the other things that I'm really careful about is, is what I eat, because we did find out that sometimes a headache would get stimulated by a seemingly good restaurant that we would go to, and it turns out that there was something that was made with MSG. So obviously I don't eat like uh, snack foods that have MSG. It's typically like crackers and potato chips with those uh, special flavorings and things like that. So, you know, even if someone brings something in that's organic, it could have like another name for MSG, you know, natural flavorings, uh, yeast extract, those kinds of things. So I really, really, really watch that. Like I will not eat something like that. I don't eat any diet um, sweetener. So um, that's been known to sh cause uh, migraine headaches. So any kind of artificial sweetener, I don't use anything at all. Um, and then obviously I, I eat like real food. And, but when you're out or you're at someone else's home, you know, you don't know. So people who invite me over to their home, I mean, they do know that like I can't have that or certain kinds of soy sauce or sauces, um, any kind of prepackaged thing, taco seasoning, like, so like, they have I, artificial I, I'm like a rough things. person to have over for dinner because I can't, I can't have that kind of stuff. But, you know, who wants to get a migraine? So, you know, that was a big component. Okay. And then the other component was the period um, menstrual cycle issue. But, um, you know, I ended up having an endometrioma on my ovary that I had to have removed. And then I went on a whole natural regime for that where I took vitamin E, fish oil. And um, then as I aged, I took some natural hormone replacement. So that aspect of things was just completely yeah. knocked out. So kind of was a combination of things, but I think the underlying cause was definitely structural. And then I guess the take home message is that always address the cause. Yeah. Like you could have went on propranolone even for the endometriosis that you had after the surgery. The surgeon actually told you that you need to get on new Lupron, because right. you still have endometriosis, and then the rest of it you just treat it naturally, and you haven't even had any attacks whatsoever. The, so, you, so basically for over 20 years you haven't had a menstrual issue, you haven't had that debilitating pain from menstruation or endometriosis, you haven't had basically any headaches whatsoever in over 20 years. So I guess right. that's really the take home message. Yeah. No, I mean, the, the, the take home message is, you know, figure out the cause. Don't, don't be satisfied with what they're telling you. That's it's not okay. It's, it's not. Like, who wants to take some kind of medication for the whole rest of their lives, you know? Or uh, not know, like, when it's going to come on and then, you know, you're going to have to, you know, emergently take it or something. So the other thing I should mention, too, uh, is sulfites uh, in food. Uh, that is one other thing that I watch really closely. I like to have wine. After we went to Italy, I learned how to pair wine with food, and that's an awesome thing for me to do. But I buy only sustainable organic wine, and then I also use a filter thing that I pour it through. Um, so it takes out the sulfites. Some people get headaches from that or from histamine, so I am really careful with that too. But if I go out to a restaurant and have wine, I you can actually buy little things you stir in the wine to get the sulfites out if you want to. Or, you know, just have one glass and you're probably going to be okay. But, yeah, look for, like, I guess you got to observe what's going on in your life. Like, when mm -hmm. are they coming on? What's yeah. happening? What are you doing at the time? And, you know, what makes it better? What makes it worse? And then, you know, you got to come to somebody like us because the reason that we're curing people like me is because we address the structural problem, we address the metabolic issues. So, both. Thank you so much for being our guest. Thanks.